one we're going to discuss the Enlightenment as a movement and as far as it goes how it influences state systems uh, and people's ideas about how a government should be set up. It's going to, of course, uh, challenge some of the older methods and propose some newer ones. So the Enlightenment itself uh, is kind of a philosophical, intellectual movement uh, where people question certain things about society in particular uh, and governmental systems and how they had been run in the past and try to look at them through a new lens that's guided by reason, um, science, and um, empirical evidence and observation. So I'll, I'll detail that here. So it's gonna take place kind of in the late 17th century. Some of these ideas are gonna be formulated late 17th century. Um, so the late 1600s. And it's gonna, I mean, people argue about exactly when it ended, whether it was 1789 with the French Revolution or 1800, or even some people argue a little bit beyond. Um, but we can say till roughly about uh, uh, the year 1800 or so century is about when it's going to kind of end-ish. So here's some characteristics of this movement. All right, so uh, they're going to emphasize, like I said, about roughly three things uh, for how to know something. They're very concerned with about knowing what's right and pursuing truth with a capital T. Truth with a capital T meaning like it's objectively true. Uh, no matter what, whether we're aware of it or not, there's nothing we can do to change it. Like, this is the way things are. This is the way they're supposed to be. Uh, and this is the way they are to all things. Um, regardless of the perspective, uh, these fundamentals are true. Uh, so, characteristics. Um, they are major proponents of what you call reason. In fact, you probably capital R that some of them did. Uh, reason meaning there should be logical, uh, plausible, observable explanations for something. So um, reason would dictate that if I say something is true, whether it's like, uh, uh, let's say it's um, the, 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 one of the classic examples, the sun being the center of the solar system rather than the earth, uh, reason would dictate that um, the way I know that the sun is at the center of the universe is if I look at how the other stars are, uh, are moving throughout the, the sky, um, when you plot it out mathematically, it makes more sense, as far as the pattern and predictability of where they are, that they're actually going around the sun and so are we. Uh, whereas if everything was orbiting us, it would have a certain trajectory. And if you log the stars and the sun uh, every day for a year or however long, uh, you'll notice that it doesn't follow the trajectory of if they were circling around the earth uh, because we're actually orbiting the sun. Uh, and it does match that trajectory. So that would be a reason. Uh, you're sort of empirically proving something is true uh, and that it makes sense. And then of course you can add on layers like, oh, since now we know that it's bigger, uh, it has a higher gravitational field or a stronger gravitational field, so that's why we orbit it as opposed to the, uh, the opposite. And uh, that's using reason. So you're putting forth an explanation and you can back it up uh, on logical premises or with mathematics uh, and, and generally speaking observation too. So reason uh, as a way to pursue truth or knowledge. Uh, also the scientific method uh, is a very popular way of, of, of knowing how things work and play out. So rather than just sort of assuming uh, or, or guessing why something works the way it does, uh, you would actually want to go out and actually test it uh, using the scientific method. Of course the scientific method is, it should be something that if you say, oh, this is uh, how I believe light works, uh, you should be able to demonstrate that in an experiment over and over and over. Uh, so you, you, you try to explain some phenomenon, you have, have a theory about how light works or, or you know, what it's composed of, uh, and then you can actually show everybody that with an experiment. Uh, and so can they. So it's not just like an illusion, although you could definitely use an illusion, but uh, people should be able to read your theory and then take it and apply it themselves without you, uh, as long as they have the instruments for it, and you should get the same result. Uh, and that's the scientific uh, method. So you try to explain something uh, logically, and then you put it to the test. Uh, so you detail what the experiment is, you carry it out, and it should, it should you know, show that result consistently for, for multiple people. It should be replicable. All right, so that, these two are gonna be very uh, foundational um, uh, qualities uh, or components, elements of, of discovering what, what is, how, how things work and, and acquiring knowledge. And the last one, and it's gonna be a mix of these two, uh, is an empiricism, empirical uh, evidence, I, I guess you could say, or empiricism, uh, to pursue.
knowledge, uh, or in their eyes, truth, capital T. And again, I, we know this doesn't really exist now, but they believe that certain things were true regardless of whether you believed them or not, or you were aware of them or not, or if you did anything, they wouldn't, they wouldn't change. But we know that's not entirely true. Uh, mostly from this right here, uh, empirical, so we got reason, um, double line this, reason, scientific method, empirical evidence. Empirical evidence is something you can observe. All right, so it kind of goes hand in hand with the scientific method in that uh, if I'm gonna conduct an experiment and show something, uh, me seeing how it plays out uh, is, gonna, is going to play into this empirical evidence. So my sensory information takes it in uh, and I observe it directly uh, and I can see that, oh, this experiment works multiple times. So I used reason to try to figure out why something worked, then I tested it out, laid it out so people could also uh, replicate it and see it to find out how the world works. And they more or less believed you could use these methods to figure out everything and eventually figure out exactly how the universe works and find out, uh, uh, pursue truth and knowledge that way. Uh, and by the way, what they're gonna be rejecting is so they can pursue truth this way and they're gonna reject the old methods for, for pursuing this, this knowledge. So uh, rejection of tradition, not for sake of tradition, not just rejecting it because it's a tradition, um, they're going to reject accepting something just because it is a, a tradition. So they, they might believe that, um, I kind of made that ambiguous, but let me restate this. They don't believe all things that are traditional are wrong, but they do think it's wrong to assume that it's correct just because that's the way it's been or it's a tradition. They realize that past explanations uh, or processes could be incorrect, so we need to uh, test them to see if they are. So they reject tradition just for tradition's uh, sake. Uh, they also reject um, divinity as a source of uh, knowledge. So they're not going to listen to you just because you say uh, you're a representative of God or you spoke to God. So revelation would be another one. You had some like divine moment. Uh, they reject the supernatural. Uh, so, you know, saying things were happened because of witchcraft or... or, or or some sort of sorcery, uh, believes in ma belief in magic. Uh, they're not going to believe in things like the Philosopher's Stone, things like that. Um, these old myths about how things in the world work. And there's, I could go on with this list, but they're going to reject those elements as well as uh, your uh, intuition. Uh, because they want to, even if you feel like something's right, uh, that's what intuition is, like an instinctual feeling of like, I know this is right, I know this is how it works, I know this is what I should do. Uh, they're not going to believe you just because you feel that it is. Uh, they're going to have to actually uh, logically apply that, uh, test it, and observe that it actually works. So if you're going to say that the um, sky is blue because there's a, a fervent layer that prevents water from holding, holding back, and you feel that's true, or you read it in the Bible, or whatever it might be, um, that um, they're not going to believe you just because you feel it, or just because somebody wrote about it thousands of years ago. They're going to test it, and of course, uh, they're going to find out that that's not the case. So that's, that's sort of what this movement's all about. And you're like, well, how does this apply to government? Because a lot of governmental systems at the time, and the time, of course, being back uh, in the times prior to and during the 17th century, all the way to the 18th century, governments were set up this way. Uh, they weren't set up, for the most part, this way. They were set up this way. So if I were to set up a government now, uh, based on Enlightenment ideals, I would set them up based on uh, what I think will logically work as far as how people work and how their behavior works. And I would find that out, of course, by, by observing people and how they behave. I'd come up with some theory that, about, oh, well, I think people operate most efficiently or, or most happily or, or, or most safely in these conditions. And then you go out and test it by uh, observing other societies, comparing them or, or logging data about how people behave or, or setting up a, a small society where you kind of see how things go. Uh, and that way you'd be able to see how it actually plays out um, using surveys or observation or, or whatever it might be to confirm, oh, this is actually a better way to arrange people than this way, the, the prior way. Uh, and these prior ways were largely established this. So when we're applying this to state systems, uh, we realize that they are going to um, reject um, traditional, or at least in a question, and then of course, when they question, they figure out that they're essentially made up for the most part. They're gonna reject, at least according to them, uh, reject tradition, uh, traditional state, society forms uh, in favor or that are dependent on dependent on um, these sources up here 
absurd. Uh, absurd means uh, it's it's not reason it's not logical it's not reasonable uh, so like uh, for example something that's absurd is saying that um, let's say I was uh, I I had cancer and they put me on chemotherapy and I was cured uh, which is almost certainly due to either my immune system uh, or a random event uh, where the, the the cancer might develop what is it called super it's not called super cancer hyper cancer. Whatever it is where cancer actually gets cancer and that kills the cancer and then you don't have cancer. Um, but then, uh, or, or it could have been the chemotherapy, right? But it'd be absurd for me to say that, oh, I was uh, healed by a, a, a blessing I received from some shaman over here. Uh, that'd be absurd because you can't test it, you can't prove it. And in fact, if we do, to, do go to uh, test that and prove it, uh, it's likely not going to show up. Um, so absurd beliefs are ones that are illogical, irrational, uh, etc. And they're going to believe that many religious traditions and state systems were based on these absurd, irrational uh, features, whether it's uh, just traditional authority, um, some sort of claims of revelation or divinity or supernatural um, features or the people's intuition, uh, that that is going to not be a way to set up state systems. So that's going to be how it's going to apply. So they're going to reject things like, uh, for example, for traditional states, just systems. Um, What's referred to, at least in France, is like the uh, ancient regime, or ancient regime, I can't remember how to pronounce it in French. Uh, but they're going to reject these traditional uh, systems, which are, for the most part, going to be, uh, not necessarily monarchy, but I would say absolute monarchy. So we'll, we'll just put the divine right of kings, because that's a, that's a good way of phrasing it. That's specific. They're definitely going to, they might not think that all monarchies are tyrannical and need to be demolished, because they don't in England, they keep it, they just limit it. Uh, but they definitely are going to claim, they're going to challenge the claim that the monarch is like somehow uh, their soul is metaphysically bound to uh, God and you can't disobey them because they're uh, God's authority as well as secular authority. So divine right of kings is going to be challenged. Oh, not divine right, right. They're also going to challenge uh, um, uh, the nobility. Maybe not the individuals in it, but certainly the process by which you are placed in and stay in uh, the nobility. Uh, so that's that, you know, hereditary lineage. Uh, they're not going to say just because you're born into a class or a family that, that makes you a uh, superior fact. They're going to say the opposite. They're going to, after Locke, say that, no, we're all born kind of on the same um, intellectual level um, in that um, there's no inherent wisdom granted to people that makes them better to rule just because of where they're born. Uh, they're challenge nobility, at least the hereditary lineage. And again, in fact, one of these guys we're going to talk about is technically a noble, uh, the lower houses. But they're not going to say that all nobles are incorrect, but they're going to say you don't have to be a noble to, 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 to be well or, or good at your job. Uh, and then lastly, they're, of course, going to uh, oppose things like uh, uh, the clergy or religious authority in, in the state. And you might think to yourself, well, that's exactly what the governments are back then. And you're right. Uh, as we talked about before, um, you've got the church and the state are, are intertwined, especially in Catholic states, uh, and of course around the world, uh, especially in the, the Muslim world and others, uh, you're also going to have that binding of church and state. Uh, you've got the, the feudal nobility uh, are still involved in Europe and the government. Uh, you've got um, increasingly centralized and absolutist monarchs that are kind of doing whatever they want at the time. Uh, so those are going to be very prominent features that are not based on anything uh, or at least mostly not based on anything that is uh, characteristic of the Enlightenment. So what are they going to uh, suggest instead? Some of the themes that they're going to uh, suggest or offer up as an alternative, um, a more Enlightenment alternative, would be things like, um, rather than giving you some sort of uh, uh, genetic, not even genetic, uh, some sort of class-based superiority or attachment to uh, uh, the divine, they're going to emphasize uh, individual ability and rights. Ability and rights uh, instead of um, class-based rights or uh, uh, or ability uh, or divinely bestowed rights and ability. So that's going to emphasize. Uh, so I should, I'll put that enlightenment emphasized regarding states, uh, individual ability and rights. They're also going to emphasize uh, liberty. So you shouldn't be limited based on 
a, a, a class birth uh, or placement in a caste system. You shouldn't be limited based on your religious beliefs. Uh, you should only be limited according to them based on your own uh, ability, more or less. Uh, that's kind of how it's going to turn out, at least under Napoleon uh, later on uh, in France. So um, liberty, uh, fraternity too. Uh, fraternity, I'm going to combine this kind of with cosmopolitanism. They're definitely different, but they're related. Cosmopolitanism. Um, fraternity is kind of like this sense of brotherhood and common humanity. That's definitely coming in from the Renaissance humanism influence. So fraternities meaning like, oh, well, maybe different individuals, but we're all humans, so we should work together uh, as opposed to against each other. Not that you shouldn't compete or debate. Uh, they're big proponents of freedom of speech, but uh, they're not, people aren't inherently your enemies that you should look to uh, subvert or destroy or harm. Uh, you can disagree and that's fine, but uh, they don't want you to feel like there's some other type of subspecies or different species that you should be opposed to. Uh, so in the cosmopolitanism, they're increasingly less concerned with um, cultural differences uh, and differences of opinion. So cosmopolitanism is kind of like, or cosmopolitan, yeah, cosmo cosmopolitanism is kind of like the idea that uh, different opinions and cultures and races, etc., should all be uh, uh, equally treated, maybe not equally valued, but equally treated at least, uh, and that should be, they should be allowed to coexist amongst each other. So it shouldn't just be whatever ethnic group or whatever ethnic group or religion is dominant, they shouldn't just impose their will on the others. They should allow those others to operate uh, without interference, uh, so long as they're maintaining social harmony. All right, so that's kind of what they believe regarding those. They also believe in, uh, what else could we write here? Individual rights, we got that. Uh, natural rights would, would coincide with that too. Um, oh, religious toleration, it kind of goes with cosmopolitanism a bit, but religious toleration. Uh, the big proponent is the social contract theory, which we'll talk about here. And we talked about briefly before, uh, but the idea that we all kind of willingly give up some rights uh, uh, and freedoms to a state that could uh, govern and form laws and maintain order because if we didn't have it, uh, it runs the risk of being uh, a chaotic free-for-all anarchy. Not necessarily what all all humanity would result in that all the place all the time, but the possibility is much more likely if you don't have a state structure to try to maintain order. So social contract theory, and I probably I feel like I'm missing a big one. Natural rights, liberty, fraternity, cosmopolitan, religious toleration, social contract theory. Oh, constitutionalism, there we go. So the idea that, um, because government shouldn't be dictated by these uh, absurd um, characteristics like, oh, because God placed you there, God talks to you, or because you're born of this family. Um, you shouldn't give every, anybody complete control. Uh, you should limit what the, they can do with the Constitution. So a Constitution is part of the social contract theory in that people get together, decide what the government can and can't do, uh, and that it should protect their uh, rights and interests, uh, and uh, that is the limiting set of rules for the government. So if they go beyond those rules, they you know abuse their power or they're not adhering to the policies that they're supposed to according to that constitution, that written document, uh, that you should um, impeach them or get rid of them. Impeach just means essentially put on trial uh, or reform the government. So that's kind of what the overall influence the Enlightenment has on um, political ideas and ideas for state systems. And these are gonna be, uh, a profound set of ideas. Um, a lot of them are going to bleed in from England during the 17th century um, as a part of that struggle between Parliament and the monarchy uh, and some English thinkers like Hobbes and Locke and others. Um, but they're going to, so yeah, they're going to profoundly influence uh, Western governments. Uh, Western governments. And now, of course, in the 20th and 21st century, it extended beyond just Western governments, but uh, strictly starts out with Western governments. Um, most notably, uh, the United States government, uh, as well as uh, France, uh, Latin America, uh, and others, starting in the late uh, 18th century here with the U.S., uh, the American Revolution, the Artux Confederation, and uh, the U.S. Constitution, in France, their revolution, their constitution, and then their unfortunate deviation from these to the uh, reign of terror, which was a very counter-enlightenment-inspired 
series. Uh, and then, of course, the Latin American revolutions as well uh, in the um, uh, areas that are now basically South America, the Caribbean, Central America as well. Uh, and over there, it's going to be a little different, though, because when you start getting into part of the French Revolution, certainly under Napoleon, uh, and part of the Latin American revolutions, or parts of them, they're also driven by nationalism, which isn't necessarily Enlightenment. Uh, in fact, the romantic element of it, in that, like, our ethnicity's best, you need to get out, and we need to preserve this, this, this nation and this ethnic group, um, and, and, and push out minority or dissenting beliefs, that's very anti-Enlightenment. That is part of the counter-enlightenment. Uh, so these ones become less clearly tied to the enlightenment, but certainly the enlightenment is part of it uh, in that they're trying to throw off the yoke of oppression by the monarchy, nobility, and clergy, uh, or in the case of Latin America, well, the same thing, uh, the monarch across the ocean, uh, potentially the clergy as well, uh, and any nobility that are over there for bleeding out from the encomienda system uh, or uh, the nobility in uh, the, the continental parts. So that's why it's uh, significant. So let's quickly, uh, quickly with quotations, go over um, probably the four most influential uh, thinkers that uh, formulated these Enlightenment ideals, or at least codified them. Uh, and then those ideals would, of course, influence the uh, governments and the national uh, uh, revolutions of the late 18th century and uh, uh, 19th century. So. One of the earliest ones uh, we've got is a guy named Thomas Hobbes. And he was alive much earlier than the rest, 1588, until um, he died in, it was just before the Glorious Revolution, I think it was 1679. Don't quote me though. Uh, and he's of course gonna be an English, English, uh, he did a lot of things actually. He's a philosopher, uh, he's a mathematician, uh, he studied uh, uh, law, like jurisprudence, uh, legal, uh, etc. Uh, but he's going to write, he's going to write multiple things. Um, one, he composes sort of his overall view, I forget the name of the document, his overall views of, of, of society and how states should be structured before the English Civil War, and then he sort of changed it afterwards. Before he basically was in support of just having a sovereign absolute uh, government uh, that you couldn't get rid of, and then afterwards, he realized that sometimes you need to, um, and that uh, because Parliament, of course, uh, rose up and fought against and defeated the monarchy, that uh, actually the people were a part of that government, that if, uh, if, if your ruler is going beyond the rules you set for it, uh, you, you, uh, you might lose your spot as the government head. Um, so that more refined theory is most clearly uh, laid out in his um, uh, work called Leviathan uh, in 1651. And uh, this is where he's gonna lay out a couple things, but the one we're gonna focus on is uh, his social contract theory. And social contract theory is kind of like the idea that, again, I mentioned this before, people get together and agree to listen to whatever authority whether it's a king or, or, or a parliament or whatever it might be. And that government, that apparatus, of course, is socially constructed because we made it up. Uh, we give them authority. So we're giving up some of our rights. They can kind of tell us what to do and what we can't do to some extent. Uh, but we give, them, we give them some freedom and, and ideally we, we, we sort of circumscribe what those roles and powers are with the Constitution. Uh, but we give our authority or some of our rights up uh, to this authority figure. And the reason why we have them is uh, to maintain uh, higher levels of peace and prosperity than if there weren't any uh, sovereign authority that could present rules and punish us for violating those rules. Um, so that's what social contract theory is, uh, giving, up, giving up certain rights to a state in order to greater... Uh, maintain uh, freedom and prosperity. And he's going to uh, basically detail why he believes you need a social contract uh, agreement to maintain a stable society. So the first thing he sort of lays out, he sort of discusses human nature. And I, I'm going to be paraphrasing here, obviously, and only incorporating some of the ideals he talked about. 
but uh, one of his views of human nature was that uh, we weren't inherently good, wonderful people who were altruistic and harmonious with each other in nature, as opposed to a later thinker named Rousseau, who's going to come up with some pretty uh, damaging ideas. Um, with a hint of truth, at least some of them, but nonetheless. Uh, human nature is going to uh, ultimately be selfish. Not necessarily that everybody's selfish and you can't trust anyone, because you can. Uh, but the fact that one selfish and untrustworthy element can and does exist in many and most people, in fact, in all people to some degree, that you have to watch out for this. So you, you shouldn't live life thinking that everyone's inherently good and harmonious and won't do any harm because they can't, because ultimately they're, they're, there is an element of, of selfishness in everybody, uh, which of course is gonna be different from person to person. Because it's there, you sort of have to watch out for others. Uh, and we're competing, of course, over resources because we need uh, food to live. So we're, we're naturally going to be inclined to feed ourselves and our families before some people we don't know, right? So selfish, uh, resource dependent. And that uh, in, a, in an existence with no state to, to form laws and regulate practices and administer punishments for those who violate the laws that are intended to protect other people, um, it would be sort of a state of anarchy, but I don't mean the like humanitarian anarcho-syndicalism that 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 you know believes we would harmoniously live in these independent federations, not coerced by some uh, uh, structural hierarchy. I'm talking like the kind of kind of anarchy that comes to mind when like there's a, a blackout in a city and then people go rioting and looting, which happens frequently uh, when those sorts of circumstances arise. Not always, but they they certainly do uh, enough to be concerning. Uh, resource dependent, uh, state of, uh, of anarchy. And he, of course, believes that's going to be a, a free for all, uh, every man for himself sort of thing, or at least every man in their family. Uh, and that uh, existence in this uh, state, no, or lack of state, existence in this lack of state would uh, result in a, I think he characterizes like a, a brutish and short and violent existence. Um, so basically, people are all out for their own. Uh, good in the end, and that, that would result in competition for resources, uh, which would result in these sort of violent brutish deaths uh, that, that characterize most of the lives. Free for all uh, and uh, short brutish lives. Uh, he also states too that um, human beings of course greatly fear a violent death. Nobody wants to have their stuff taken and be uh, killed or, or, or used against their will for somebody else. So um, this fear of uh, violent death uh, sort of compels us to form these states. So the reason why we have these is because we're, we're ultimately out for ourselves, but we also fear um, a violent death, of course, and we also fear that um, we're not going to be able to... Um, benefit from any of our work. So, for example, if I go to all this effort to start this farm with my family and there's no state and we have all this food available for us, yay us, um, I'm not going to realistically think that I can continue doing that because somebody could come in at any time and they probably will uh, and, and take from me or, or kill us and take our stuff, whatever it might be. Um, so, he mentions that we fear a violent death uh, and we uh, cannot enjoy uh, the fruits of our labor. Uh, so any, any quest to make yourself smarter, improve the world, uh, accrue things for yourself, maybe even for others, uh, to enjoy works of art, read, write, whatever it might be, you can't do these things because you're constantly in a state of survival and protection, uh, and, and we dislike that. So because we're fearing this violent death, and then we want to be able to enjoy our labors and do things that are meaningful to us, uh, we, uh, we are compelled to uh, form and abide by... Uh, by state systems. So because uh, we fear these things, so this is the, the element of human nature, we fear not being able to enjoy the fruits of our labor and a violent death, we actually agree to these states. Uh, and he believes that this is the best or most optimal way to exist as human beings. Um, not that it's fantastic having somebody tell you what you can and can't do and enforcing that. Um, and of course there's different theories about how to go about that to allow more freedom. But um, he's gonna say that that's probably our best bet considering how humans are and what we want. 
Uh, so this is where the social contract theory comes in because he believes that uh, people should, uh, in doing so, they um, willingly uh, give up rights, certain freedoms. Uh, so there are rules and there are punishments for those rules and those are enforced by uh, a sovereign. Uh, give up certain freedoms uh, to a sovereign. And of course, this can be interpreted as like an absolute monarch or a parliament or a Republican, uh, some sort of Republican government, like a democratic uh, republic with a parliament or whatever. Uh, it could be any form. Uh, he's actually referring more so to a, uh, an absolute monarchy or at least an absolute sovereign. Uh, nonetheless, this could be a person or a group a sovereign person or group uh, who is granted uh, certain uh, powers, I guess you would say, slash authority. Uh, and because he suggests that since we're sort of, this is the consent of the governed idea, that uh, we are kind of saying, here's what you can and can't do, uh, that we shouldn't complain about the conditions that the sovereign uh, lays out, so long as he's abiding by the, the general idea that we, we had laid out. That was kind of the shift, by the way, from his first work to, to Leviathan. Uh, but that's kind of what social contract theory is. And again, he's really influenced by um, what's going on in England at the time, especially um, uh, the, the recent series of wars in the English Civil War. Really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They really influenced his views. Uh, because again, he, he realized this is at least one characteristic about, of human nature that can't be ignored, uh, and that people fear violent death and losing the things that they work for. So we uh, do and should willingly submit uh, uh, some of our freedoms uh, and autonomy to some sort of sovereign uh, authority, be it a person or a group, uh, to sort of set up a functioning uh, society with rules that are enforced to uh, maintain society and protect those ideas. And that's going to be a, uh, a major... A major fundamental theory uh, that's going to uh, influence later thinkers like Locke and the Enlightenment thinkers and uh, basically all governments that exist now, at least Western governments that exist now. Um, and we've seen this before, like the Magna Carta is essentially this to some extent, uh, but he's the first person to very clearly uh, articulate why we need it uh, and what it actually is. Uh, and that's going to be influential going forward. Uh, in fact, that's going to lead to the next English philosopher. Um, his name is, he's just more than just a philosopher, but the next I want to talk about is John Locke. John Locke is John Locke. also an Englishman, existing um, at least for part of uh, Hobbes' life, um, 1632 to 1704, I think, if that's not right, it's close to that. Uh, and he's also an English uh, philosopher. Uh, and he's one of the uh, early capitalists before capitalism even had a name. Um, his practices were very capitalistic. Uh, capitalist. Uh, and uh, he was definitely involved in science. But I would just say intellectual. So he wrote several things. And uh, it, it, it's hard for me to remember all of the names of the documents, but uh, I do remember at least the, the theories he had about them. Uh, and they're all published about the same time, around 1688, 1689. Um, He's a very influential person. He's going to, of course, be influenced by Locke for, uh, or by Hobbes. He's going to also be a proponent of social uh, uh, contract theory, uh, as well as Locke's or Hobbes's basic premise about the consent of the government. But he's going to add another element to that. Um, he's also going to be in support of um, slash consent of government here, and of course, consent of government is like our permission to give this authority to the state um, is, is what a government is, essentially. Um, he's also going to be a proponent of religious freedom, or at least tolerance. And um, economic liberty, slash property rights. And that's, of course, uh, coming from his uh, very capitalist uh, practice and mentality. So uh, let's do the... Um, religion first. So, um, I think the document was called Letters Concerning, or the set of documents, Toleration or Religion. I might have the name slightly off on that. Um, that's around the 1688-89 mark. Um, over here, he's going to actually, ironically enough, be influenced by colonists 
uh, in the British colonies. I think it was Rhode Island. Uh, the Baptists there formed a constitution that was predicated on religious toleration and freedom. Uh, and he believed they were right, that people should have freedom of conscience, the freedom to follow which whatever religion they believe is correct based on uh, their interpretations of the world or, or, or biblical texts or whatever it might be. Um, so he's going to be uh, advocate, be an advocate of, advocate of uh, religious toleration. And of course be influenced uh, by uh, the Rhode Island Constitution. That was in 1692, I think, it was written. Or sorry, 1632? That might be wrong, but it, it's much earlier uh, than his actual writings. Um, and they were Baptists, and again, they, they were big proponents of, free, of, of freedom of conscience so that you can sort of pursue what you feel is right based on how you read the Bible or, or whatever it might be. Um, and uh, he also uh, argued this because, you know, if, if you can go out and read the Bible or whatever, the Quran or, or the Torah, whatever documents you read, the Analects, um, there's no real way to prove whose interpretation is correct. So if I think that the Bible says this is what's good, what should be done, and you say this, there's no real way to know who's right and who's wrong. Um, so he says, since there is no way to know, you should allow sort of anyone to do uh, what, believe what they want to believe religiously. Uh, and there's no harm in doing that. In fact, trying to maintain a specific interpretation of like enforcing the specific church, uh, the Anglican church in the state of England or, or the specific Catholic or uh, beliefs in a, in a Catholic state or whatever it might be, or um, um, uh, Islam in, in Muslim states, that there's actually more problems there because you're going to get more violence than having everybody believe what they want as long as they're not harming other people. Uh, so he's going to say uh, enforcing a specific interpretation is more uh, violence or, or harmful than allowing peaceful toleration. Uh, and he was very much against um, using violence to compel somebody to uh, believe a certain set of beliefs. Uh, violence uh, to compel, uh, certainly immoral by law standards. Uh, so that's kind of his basic set of views on religion. Um, he's also going to, um, well, we'll talk more about religion uh, with, uh, with uh, the next guy we talk about, which is Voltaire and Fran. Uh, so that's going to sort of establish his the next document, religious toleration. So the next document we'll talk about with him uh, was written, it's called An Essay on or of, on human understanding. Uh, 1689, I believe as well, or around that time. Uh, and like I said before, it's gonna be about the human mind. So he's not gonna be an advocate or someone who believes in this concept that you know, you're born into a certain class with superior uh, innate knowledge. He's not an innatist. An innatist is somebody who believes that you're born with a certain set of abilities um, or knowledge that you tap into uh, throughout your life. That was kind of started by the ancient Greeks with Socrates and Plato. Uh, he was much more along the lines of, of Aristotle believing you learn things through experience. So um, he uh, made a statement that the human mind is a blank slate, or the tabula rasa in Latin. Uh, the human mind is a blank slate. Uh, in that because we're born with no innate set of knowledge or abilities, which again, we know isn't correct now. We definitely know psychologically that you're born with uh, a certain genetic predisposition uh, for certain temperaments and abilities, uh, but you of course do have to acquire a lot of skills and knowledge through experience and your environment can impact uh, certainly how your brain develops uh, regarding um, access to education, uh, proper nutrition, things like that for realizing your potential. Um, so he's not right or wrong completely and, and neither are uh, innatists, but it's gonna be a combination. But he is right in that human beings aren't inherently superior because of some uh, divinely bestowed gift or wisdom uh, or some sort of hereditary lineage uh, through um, the nobility. Um, so that's what he's gonna be opposed to necessarily. So um, he's not exactly right in the statement, but he's, it was important it was an important statement to make at the time because people literally believed that if you weren't a part of the church or the royal family or the nobility, 
that you didn't have that connection with God for knowledge and truth, or you didn't have that uh, inherited divine wisdom um, that was, was passed on uh, in those arist aristocratic families. Um, so he believed that mine was a blank slate, and this has a lot of implications. Uh, so first of all, we acquire all of our knowledge ability through sensory uh, uh, information. So he's an empiricist, uh, definitely somebody who believes you learn from experience on the go. Uh, you don't have like innate knowledge uh, or abilities, well certainly not the knowledge portion. Um, so we learn through uh, sensory observation. So that does make him de facto an empiricist, as opposed to like a rationalist who believes you can figure things out just by thinking about them abstractly. Um, definitely elements of truth to both of them. But uh, blank, blank slate, so what does that mean? That actually is really radical at the time and necessary, uh, even though it's not technically correct. Um, it's very important because this basically says, if you're a human, you're not inherently superior to others. So that's a big statement to make at the time because again, uh, they were very much, state systems, especially in Europe, had been predicated on uh, your, your uh, connection to God, the clergy, or divine right of kings, uh, as well as your connection to these uh, divinely enhanced, the enhancedly divine, divinely enhanced wisdom of the nobility or whatever it might be. So they actually believe people are superior and wiser uh, in this specific social group, and that's why they ordered their hierarchy as, as such. Blank slate throws that out the window. It says, no, we're all born with the same capacity to learn, and so that, therefore, we are actually equal. We shouldn't be limited based on our, our birth or our class or religious beliefs. Uh, and that's going to be a major, major um, um, set of radical ideals. Um, that's going to establish the precedence that people are inherently equal. That's a big statement for the time. Um, it's Important to note out, uh, some critics have pointed out that he's kind of a hypocrite because he actually does do two things that people consider hypocritical. Uh, he invests in and doesn't outright oppose the um, slave trade. He definitely profits from it. So that's a good piece of evidence to show that uh, even if he does believe it, he's not a, applying it to his life. Uh, and, and he might only really be applying it in his mind to uh, Europeans or, or capitalists. But that's a good piece of evidence to show that he, he's not quite in here, but that was not abnormal for the time. There were almost no advocates that, um, especially in the 17th century, that in anywhere in the world that were, were against slavery. It's been a part of every civilization um, ever since uh, human societies have existed, and we know that. Uh, but that's kind of a hypocritical point, even if it's a, uh, I don't want to say it's small, slaves are, slavery is awful, but... Uh, it, it is one element that's a bit hip hypocritical. He also wrote the Constitution for Carolina, which was based on um, uh, nobility. There were these like lords, these lord protectors that were in charge of everybody and had absolute sovereignty, um, uh, even though everybody else could theoretically be equal. But some people point out that his forming of that Constitution wasn't him applying his beliefs. It was kind of like a lawyer writing out a will. It's like somebody tells you what to write and you're the one that puts it in this language that is uh, protected and understandable uh, legally. So he might have written that constitution not believing the ideals, uh, but the, the, the king or the parliament instructed him or asked him to write them out and gave him the, the elements they wanted to include. Nonetheless, uh, he bought, is going to establish this precedent, precedent, and that does imply that we're all inherently equal. Uh, and he actually states as such that um, people should be upon birth uh, uh, granted or, or have respected these what we call natural rights now. Uh, he mentioned, I think, uh, life, liberty, health, and um, um, uh, labor, like the spoils your labor, your possessions. So people kind of lump that as, as property. So that's what we'll write here. Um, but uh, he believed that uh, all born with um, natural rights, so because we're inherently born equal, you don't have the right to take these things from somebody uh, just based on their uh, existence or, or, or class standing or, or birth. Uh, of course, that's going to be life, liberty. So liberty of life, of course, meaning people can't just come up and kill you. Uh, liberty, your freedom, they can't just take away uh, your ability to do what you want. You know, hold you as a slave, even though you invest in the slave uh, trade. Um, they can't hold you as a slave or a serf. Uh, they can't limit what you do. Um, you should be able to do what you want, essentially. Uh, and then the uh, property, which again, he, he phrased it slightly differently, but people kind of lump it as property uh, and property. 
Property to him, by the way, meant something specific. It meant um, the stuff that you owned that was capitalized uh, made you money, essentially. Um, so he, he did believe, of course, in a certain amount of, of, of land that should be open to the public uh, for common use, uh, like, you know, roads, parks, things like that, certain um, uh, areas. Of course, designated for public access. But he believed that all private property, ones that people own, should be used to produce things. Uh, and that if you weren't, you probably didn't own or, or, or deserve that property. Um, so he was definitely an, an early proto-capitalist uh, before, you know, Adam Smith sort of codifies these beliefs during the Enlightenment. But nonetheless, um, he believed that you should keep what you made, your possessions, the fruits of your labor, uh, and of course you're entitled to do what you want to do, as long as you're not taking away from other people, and that uh, people don't have any right to just take your life, and, unless perhaps you deserve to because you're convicted of a crime for murder or rape or whatever it might be. <clears throat> um, that's going to be a profound set of, uh, a revolutionary set of beliefs that of course are going to profoundly influence uh, all of those Western governments that uh, apply these Enlightenment ideals, like in the American Re Revolution, U.S. Constitution, Declaration of Independence that stated these things, French Revolution, uh, and many others, and constitutions that have come afterwards, uh, mostly in the West, but, but increasingly outside of just the Western um, 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 sphere of influence or, or states. All right. <clears throat> the next one is once he establishes these ideas um, about why we should allow people to practice their own religions, and why we should, uh, um, why people are inherently equal and should be granted these natural rights. He discusses how the state should be set up uh, to protect these things and, and ensure these things. So, uh, the third one we'll talk about is a, a set of, of, of uh, publications referred to as the two uh, treatises of Iran government. Iran government. Uh, point of note: some of it was lost. There's like a good chunk of it that's that's missing, uh, but from some of the stuff he says, uh, people pulled certain ideas. And again, Locke, like all these guys, they wrote stuff across their whole lifetime. So sometimes they said one thing earlier in their lives, but then they, through experience or, or, or whatever, or criticisms of others or hearing other ideas, they uh, change their ideas later on in life. So sometimes even in one, one work, you might have some conflicting ideas or inconsistent ideas, but we're talking about elements people have pulled out and cited and used going forward uh, in these uh, Western governments like in the United States. So, two treaties, treaties of government, uh, of government, 1688-89 as well. <clears throat> um, we already discussed these elements. This is how he believes a state should be structured uh, to protect these things. Uh, so that's gonna apply a lot of the social contract theory. But there's one thing I wanna add to it. So everything I've said about Hobbes regarding why we have a state, and what the state's role is, like, you know, we agree to a state to, to ensure greater protection and freedom by giving up some. Um, he's going to elaborate on this consent of the governed idea. So obviously, to form a government, we have to agree to one and pick somebody, and, and they go out and do their thing, creating laws and enforcing them. Uh, but he more specifically didn't just say that's what a government was. He actually articulated what people should do, what their duty was. So this idea of consent of the government was uh, actually um, more of an obligation on the part of the citizens to make sure the government is protecting these rights, whether it's religious freedom or whether it's life, liberty, property, that the government has to protect those rights. And if they're not protecting them, if they're taking them from you, um, if they are allowing others to take them from you, like they're not maintaining order, uh, they're not protecting your state against other states which are trying to take these things from you. So be three different op op possibilities here. If the government's not protecting your rights, you actually have the obligation to change or get rid of that government. And that's actually what's going to largely inspire the American Revolution is going to be this idea that if the government is not uh, treating us equally and, and granting us rights, which the colonists are going to assert that, they, that, that uh, King George and, and the British Parliament are not doing, that they actually have the right to overthrow them. Uh, certainly try to revise them, and they, they of course try to communicate and uh, make peace with uh, the British government, but when they refuse, they're like, well, okay, then we got to get rid of you because you're not acknowledging or protecting uh, the rights that we are guaranteed, certainly as British citizens, but uh, more more broadly as, as human beings. So, consent of the government uh, is the idea that you are obligated to overthrow, or at least reform. I should probably put the reform first, but, and I think I will. Oh, reform or overthrow 
any state that does not protect individual rights, natural rights. Um, that's going to be his <clears throat> uh, contribution to our elaboration on that. And all these ideas are going to be profoundly influential on those Enlightenment thinkers uh, that are prominent in France, for example, and in Germany, more so in France, uh, during the uh, uh, 18th century. Specifically from uh, the like 1715, which is kind of the death of Louis XIV, the absolutist uh, ruler in France, till roughly uh, the French Revolution. Uh, that's, these are all going to profoundly influence them. And also, too, this kind of implies that you should have some specifically laid out rights and rules for that government so you know if they're violating it. So <clears throat> whether it's directly or not, uh, this is also an endorsement of uh, constitutionalism. The idea that you need to specifically lay out uh, rights that should be protected and how the government should operate so that if they violate them, that's when you know, hey, you're not protecting this or, or, or by the way, this rule, we need to change things, try you individually, impeach you, uh, or remove the government entirely if it's, if it's, if it's all uh, corruptly uh, or improperly managing things. So, uh, Constitution, a specific uh, list, a specific document with uh, uh, explicit rights and protections and processes. So it li limits what the government can do. So that's going to be a, a, a the fundamental idea behind this consent of the government is different from Locke in or from Hobbes in that it kind of lays out what people should have and specifically says. If the government's not doing this, then get rid of them. And of course, you would have that written or understood somewhere, uh, usually in the form of a constitution. And this is going to be uh, uh, aligned with the English uh, Bill of Rights in um, uh, 1689 after the Glorious Revolution, where they specifically put all these rights and protections and limits that the monarch has uh, in the government of England. Uh, and it protects, of course, members of parliament from uh, uh, being uh, imprisoned for... for, for they're basically granted the freedom of speech in Parliament, and uh, Parliament's a permanent entity, and uh, the king uh, has to have permission to levy new taxes and laws, things like that. Those specific protections and rights uh, that exist uh, in the government and, and with the people under its authority, in the Parliament, for example, uh, that's specifically spelled out. So if the, the king, in this case, uh, in England anyway, is violating that, then they have a right to uh, uh, question reform or, or remove him, uh, which they've at this point done in 1689 twice in the last 30 or 40 years of the English Civil War, uh, those series of wars, and then the Glorious Revolution. So that's uh, our English contributions to this Enlightenment. And they're the very start of it. In fact, some people say that the Enlightenment hadn't even started yet, but these are the ideas that are gonna carry over and profoundly influence guys like uh, Voltaire, who we'll talk about, uh, and uh, Montesquieu, who we'll also talk about regarding how states should be constructed based on these Enlightenment ideals. The next thing we'll talk about are French uh, philosophical contributions to the Enlightenment. And of course, those are gonna be uh, some foundational ideas that influence US Constitution uh, and other uh, constitutions and, and Western governments going forward. So uh, we'll focus on Voltaire first. Voltaire, I think he was 1694 to 1778, roughly about that. Uh, and Voltaire is, uh, his real name is Francois, I what his last name was. It's a pen name. Uh, but he was a, he's a very famous man. Uh, he was French, and uh, he was uh, pro probably most prolific as, a, as an actual writer. He wrote like thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, uh, papers, letters, pamphlets, essays, things like that. Multiple books. Uh, he wrote plays. He was a poet. He did all kinds of writing. Uh, writer. But he's also a, uh, a philosopher, right? One who looked at the, the, the meaning of life and how to carry it out and pursue the truth and whatnot. Uh, and historian. So he did a, a lot uh, in his life. So the, the element that we're gonna focus on for him was his contributions to um, the opposition to state-enforced religion. So the ones we've talked about where, where states and religions were melded uh, together and, and you know a state would have an official religion they enforced, whether it was uh, through penal codes or, or capital punishment, whatever it might be. Um, he's gonna be one who criticizes that. So. What aligns him most clearly with the Enlightenment is the way he pursues knowledge. Uh, he's very focused on reason, so he did not like religions, 
metaphysical and, and, and universal um, theories for how the world worked and, and, and how truth was, was obtained. Uh, so he would be uh, uh, questioned, no, I said criticized, criticized, criticized uh, the absurdity of uh, most religions. So he didn't like the fact that religions taught things based on faith. Um, he thought that they claimed faith was the source of, of this knowledge and truth uh, because they lacked actual empirical evidence for that. Uh, because he couldn't use reason, the scientific method, or, or observation to see this is how the world worked and these are the consequences for behaving immorally and this is what immoral, immoral behavior is, um, that it didn't exist. And they, they essentially uh, decided or emphasize that you should just believe it based on faith because first of all, it wasn't true and they were um, using that to their advantage um, because I think he said something along the lines of if you can convince people to believe a set of absurd beliefs based on faith, then you can also convince them to uh, commit these horrible atrocities, uh, which, which he does argue, at least about states and, and religious systems. Uh, but he also, of course, sees the role of religion as far as how it is sort of used to provide some sort of social unity. So he's not like purely against religion, but he's definitely against the absurd elements of religion that are faith-based, not empirically based. And he's also gonna be against state-enforced religion. Uh, he himself believed in a God, he was a deist. He didn't believe that God is like inter involved in your life, uh, but he thinks that an intellectual being created the universe and, and we're in it doing our own thing. It's also called the clockmaker theory. Um, but he didn't care if you believed something else. Uh, he just didn't like if people tried to control you with that uh, by forcing you to believe what they believe through a, a, a private organization or through state-enforced religion. Uh, and then he also didn't like, of course, the faith-based element. So, uh, criticize the absurdity of religions based on faith. Uh, and um, and state-enforced uh, religions. Mostly because it resulted in domestic, which means inside your state, uh, and interstate, or international now, uh, um, persecution. And there's many examples you can point to this. Domestically, inside of a state, you can point to any of the uh, wars of religion in Europe, uh, the persecution of uh, Muslim and Jewish people uh, in Europe at the time, if we're looking at Christianity and the Catholic Church. Um, the Protestants that were, of course, uh, pursued and fought over in the religious wars and with the Inquisition. Um, and it's not just Christianity. You can look uh, uh, to the world of Islam, the Sunni and Shia Islam uh, conflict that's, that's killed more Muslims than anything else. Their conflicts with Christianity between the two, and um, their conflicts with the, uh, the the Hindu states, uh, with the Delhi Sultanate, and others. There's all kinds of, and, and of course, the Confucian um, repression of Buddhism. So there's all kinds of examples of religious violence domestically in a state, between a state, um, and, and he he points that out. So um, part of what he did was he went to he attempted to look at various religions. So he was very critical of, of, of Judeo-Christian religions, including Islam, um, mostly the Catholic Church and Christianity, but uh, Christianity, Judaism, uh, and Islam, he disliked, of course, their absurd elements, the, the elements they used to, uh, to uh, um, you know, using faith as a doctrine to, to endorse um, uh, atrocities and, and violence and persecution. Um, he was slightly less critical of Islam. Uh, I think it was something along the lines of he like uh, respected some of their moral codes and systems, uh, but he did not like the way they went about their, their means of spreading their religion. He didn't like the fact that um, uh, they would manipulate this faith adherence like Judeo-Christian beliefs were. Um, and then he also didn't like the violence as a part of it because Islam, especially in its early years, was very militant. Uh, they would spread by conquest and he wasn't a big fan of that. So he was a, a critical of a critical of faith uh, doctrine uh, and uh, uh, the means of enforcing and spreading. Uh, regarding Judaism, he was less critical of the religion. He was initially more critical of Jewish people, who he characterized um, as kind of that that typical. Uh, negative anti-Semitic stereotype of being 
somehow villainous uh, uh, or dishonest. But I can't remember who it was. Somebody called him out publicly and criticized him um, and, and, and asserted that his criticism of Judaism was more so aimed at Jewish people. And he sort of uh, um, agreed. And he said, uh, he basically said, I, that was my mistake. I had a couple of bad interactions with uh, Jewish people, I guess, or at least the ones that he remembered. Uh, and then um, that sort of caused him to sort of blame an entire uh, group of religion. And he actually recanted uh, or rescinded that statement and said, basically, I shouldn't judge a whole group based on the acts of a few individuals. So I thought that was a good, nice, what's the word I'm looking for? An enlightened moment where you, where you sort of realize someone else's criticism actually helps you out. Um, and that's also gonna make him, by the way, a proponent of free speech too, I should mention that. Um, so it's gonna be a couple of things that he endorses, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. So uh, regarding the Eastern religions, he was a bit, in philosophies, he was a little more lenient. Um, again, still opposed to any sort of absurd faith-based beliefs or doctrines, but he very much appreciated, for example, um, the uh, Hindu beliefs. He wasn't particularly an expert on either because there weren't many translated uh, uh, texts from, from, from you know, the Vedas and Hinduism or the Analects and Confucianism uh, in Europe at the time, in the 18th century. But from what he did read, uh, he liked a lot of it. So for Hinduism, uh, he was in particular, um, he enjoyed their uh, uh, application of animal rights because he himself was a vegetarian. He uh, really liked their morals, the way they set them up. Uh, and he also really liked Confucian uh, and, and Chinese society, Confucian. And the thing he liked about them was, I mean, there are multiple things. Uh, he thought that they should really mimic a lot of the Confucian um, fundamental uh, tenets of Confucianism. Uh, he, he's not, of course, going to be real big on the collective, kind of how uh, Confucianism is more so oriented towards family and society than the individual. But he really did like the fact that they were much less concerned with your social status uh, in that you know, you weren't like regulated to a caste system necessarily. Um, so he was very much, from what, what they kind of drew from, uh, from, from Chinese Confucian philosophy was uh, what you call meritocracy. Because he knew at least to some extent about the uh, Confucian examination system and how they believe that the people that should be making decisions should be the most qualified. Uh, and that's based on your own knowledge and ability. Uh, so from that, he, you know, pulled animal rights and meritocracy. And both these contributed to a, a very, what you'd call pluralistic, I wouldn't call him necessarily a pluralist, uh, but someone who's pluralistic, it's like cosmopolitan, uh, as far as the enlightenment goes. Someone who can appreciate other cultures um, or ideas or perspectives, so agrees that even if they're not uh, entirely right or they're a minority opinion, that uh, you shouldn't persecute them, uh, that you should allow them to uh, maintain their own beliefs or identities. Uh, and because he's a pluralist, I'll just put that, uh, uh, allow minor, cultures, perspectives, ideas to exist uh, without persecution. And also that they don't have to be assimilated necessarily um, to allow them uh, to exist without persecution. Uh, and that would, um, so that, that's a very cosmopolitan sort of belief. Because they sort of uh, realized that these alternate civilizations and cultures uh, were different. He was very much against people judging them based on their own understanding of what they think should be right, uh, whether they're metaphysical explanations for truth or how the world operated or their uh, scientific observations or theories. Uh, he wasn't a fan of people sort of like uh, condescendingly judging them based on uh, their ideas of what, what is good or right or their Christian or Judeo or, or, or Muslim values. So he's very much accepting of other cultures, which is kind of where that cultural relativism gets its start in the Enlightenment. This is where people in Europe really begin to start appreciating other cultures uh, and adopting some of their art, artistic techniques, uh, political ideas, basically the elements of their cultures that they think are promising in some way. Uh, they are, are quick to, not quick to, but they are, are open to uh, hearing them out and then incorporating them if they think they're helpful. And that's a big, a major feature of pluralism and, and cosmopolitanism is that you don't think that cultures are like these monoliths that you can't dare touch or, or, or borrow from, that if you are, it's appropriation or stealing. They believe that, um, probably correctly, um, that uh, 
cultures are, are things that should be shared and you should, of course, they're, they're changing and uh, borrowing or, or revising or getting rid of uh, certain features uh, might be of a, of a greater benefit to most people. So that is definitely part of that. But this is also, of course, where you're gonna get, uh, at least for like AP Euro goes, um, you know, the whole Chino Seri movement, appreciation for, for um, what they call Oriental or Eastern um, arts. Um, nonetheless, he's gonna be a pluralist and um, all these sort of amalgamated put together uh, are gonna form his uh, views on religion. Uh, and these are the ones that are gonna influence most profoundly uh, other Enlightenment thinkers, and of course the governments in the US Constitution, France, etc. going forward. So uh, considering all these, he's of course going to be a proponent of religious toleration. As a pluralist, he would intrinsically be, but it's a little further than that. Uh, so he was, uh, of course, a proponent of religious toleration. In fact, he endorsed it uh, and supported uh, uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia, Prussia, Prussia. Uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia, who was uh, pursuing um, uh, religious freedom in the state of Prussia, uh, who was a big fan of Voltaire and Enlightenment ideals. Uh, so he's a proponent of religious toleration. Uh, he's also one that, again, because of this pluralism, he doesn't care if you believe something different. Um, He's, of course, going to, he might object to what you believe based on um, uh, his understanding of, of uh, or what I, how should I phrase this? He's not going like, to like any of your faith-based arguments or anything he considers absurd, uh, but he's certainly going to allow or think that you should be able to believe those things on your own. So he's going to believe the toleration. He's also going to believe that religion should be a private practice and that you uh, can enjoy what you want to enjoy. Um, but you shouldn't impose it on other people, specifically... Uh, he was opposed to uh, state-enforced uh, religion. And that, of course, makes sense, uh, because uh, that was what he largely was criticizing religion for having done to uh, uh, make the world a, 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 a worse place, in that uh, using these, these faith-based arguments to uh, uh, prove or make people think things that are true, uh, so that you can convince them to commit these uh, atrocities, whether they are domestic or interstate or international, um, because they don't need evidence uh, to uh, to serve as some sort of warning or or logic or reason to sort of hold them back from uh, uh, being violent or, or pursuing these these um, what's the word I'm looking for um, pernicious activities. All right, so that's Voltaire. Next and lastly, we'll talk about probably the biggest influence, at least on the U.S. Constitution and many Western governments uh, later. And that's gonna be a uh, French noble, a lesser noble, um, referred to as uh, uh, the Baron de Montesquieu. His name was Charles Louise, or Charles Louise Montesquieu. And he was a noble of the robe, Montesquieu. Um, noble of the robe. And of course, the robe refers to the uh, garments that they wear traditionally. Um, so he was a, a lower French noble. Uh, so he had access to uh, more money than most people would, and, and maybe social right uh, and education. Uh, but the nobles of the robe were, of course, not. They weren't. They were lesser nobles because they were usually part of the the parliament, or the uh, local administrative judiciary units. Uh, so he did study law initially, uh, but he's going to transition out of uh, studied law. But he's going to uh, abandon that uh, instead and pursue his own studies. Uh, research and writing, particularly on um, well, multiple topics, but the two we'll talk about are going to be, well, one. Uh, he, he talks a lot about geography, and he believes that affects how societies develop and, and, and the rules they have and the structures and buildings and temperaments, uh, but we'll ignore that one. We'll focus on how we looked at state systems and society, because he's kind of the first person, first of all, to have the means to do this. Uh, you, of course, you have earlier explorers uh, and, and uh, and uh, um, people that are chroniclers that are chronicling their journeys. You had, you know, Marco Polo, Ibn Battuta, Zengha, and others. Um, but he's the first one that really had the time and money to go around, and the education, to go around and, and actually not just like look and see what was there, but he's actually trying to figure out and analyze state systems and legal institutions and economic institutions. So he's trying to like see how do all these different states run? Most of it's gonna be in Europe, fact, all of it's gonna be in Europe. So he's going to travel Europe. Uh, and he's kind of credited by some as like the first social anthropologist, meaning studying how humans form 
societies and, and, and law systems and state uh, structures and sort of analyzing uh, what they are, categorizing them, and then offering his opinion on, on what, based on his, his research and study, what should optimally be um, the structure of a social institution. All right, so he traveled uh, Europe. Um, I believe the, the two biggest ones that impacted him, he spent the most time were England, Italy, because remember he's from France. France. Uh, England, Italy, and then later I believe he went to more into Central Europe, like Austria, Hungary, etc. But I know England and Italy influenced him the most as far as uh, his, his theories go. So, travel throughout here. Um, and of course he's looking at, at geography and other things, but we're going to focus on um, and analyze what we're going to focus on. Uh, state systems and uh, legal uh, systems and institutions. And not just for funsies, uh, although he, of course, enjoyed it. He did, for a reason, he tried to cat, figure out how they all worked. Uh, and then once he had all this data on England and Italy and other states, including France, of course, where he's from, um, he has a sort of unique perspective to be able to analyze how they work, and he sort of starts categorizing or, or deeming functions of the state specifically. Uh, so obviously, like Locke, and Hobbes lay out the groundwork for social contract theory. Um, but he's gonna be the one that actually analyzes how they actually operate um, uh, technically. So, um, and again, he's kind of the first social anthropologist to do this. Uh, analyze these uh, institutions to, uh, to, to, to disambiguate or make more clear. Disambiguate. Uh, and um, uh, um, analyze the structure, understand structure. And of course, after he does this, he's going to sort of explain what basic states do, what the roles are, and what he thinks would be an ideal model uh, for maintaining some of those enlightenment fundamentals of like liberty, fraternity, equality, etc. Uh, so he's going to put these ideas forward in a set of works called The Spirit of Laws. It wasn't his first work, though. This is actually relevant, at least slightly. In 1721, he wrote a, a book or a, a series of letters that are kind of turned into a, a single work. Uh, called the Persian Letters, where he, uh, before he did this, went on this you know, tour and, and, and really looked at England, Italy, and other places, uh, analyzing their institutions, or at least while he was doing it, um, he's going to first criticize French society, which he has a pretty good understanding of, um, because, he is, um, because he has been raised uh, and educated in French law and society, he has a good idea of how it works and functions, and that's why he goes off to other places to figure it out. Um, and he is going to be, I didn't put when he was born, I think he was, was it 17, no, he was, he was born, I think he was born in like 1689, and I believe he died in like the mid-1700s, about right, 1750, I want to say 55, don't quote me on that though, but that's roughly when he was around, so this is kind of at the midpoint-ish, if my years are correct, and um, he has a good understanding of French society at this point, so he, uh, he, he does just that, he writes these letters about these like fake Persian travelers, uh, who walk around um, and take these trips to uh, Europe, uh, specifically in Paris, and they write these letters back to uh, their families and kingdoms in between each other um, about what they're observing. And uh, he uses this as a chance to uh, uh, criticize or critique, I should say, because I'm not critiquing doesn't mean you're, 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 you're trying to say something's wrong, but you are trying to analyze what it is and what might be wrong or maybe even what's good. Um, it's a critique of French society. So he does point out some of the elements that, of course, are... are worthy of praise, you know, their advancements as far as society goes and maybe wealth goes, etc. But he also points out the uh, absurd things too, uh, or the things that are not so wonderful, like how condescending some of the French intellectuals can be and dismissive of other cultures uh, or ideas, I shouldn't say of other cultures, but of other people and their ideas. Um, he also is going to point out that while they do have some very some excellent economic and innovative uh, uh, institutions and practices, like the printing press, for example, and how it's firmly established, and how periodicals are becoming increasingly involved in the world in print and, and education, like he, of course, praises those through his Persian observers. But he also criticizes the things too, like I said, the condescending uh, tone and nature. Uh, he's gonna be critical of the way some of the state systems function with the, the nobility and the clergy and the monarch at the helm. Uh, he's also gonna be critical of some of those persisting non-enlightenment uh, beliefs in like uh, uh, certain faith-based arguments religiously. Um, he's also gonna criticize the supernatural sort of elements too of people believing in 
alchemy and, and the philosopher's stone and things like that. Um, so he's critical of French society first, and then he extends that, of course, to um, the other societies he's analyzed, and then offers his opinion on how governments operate and how they ideally should operate. And this is the one that's going to influence people the most profoundly. Uh, 1748, I think it was published till 1750, but uh, the spirit of the laws, or spirit of the laws, I can't remember if there's two does in it or not, but just say spirit of the laws. Spirit of the laws. And that, of course, is basically um, establishing what he believes after observing all these different governments, how these governments function, basically, and then how um, uh, they should be tweaked to optimize and protect um, individual rights and all these enlightenment ideas. So uh, he asserts that, of course, you have sovereigns, kings, groups, parliaments, things like that, but those can be actually reduced to several administrative functions of the government. Uh, so uh, that's what we're going to focus on. Administrative functions can sort of be uh, broken down into three roles. Administrative functions of the state. Uh, that is the making of laws. And he's going to, I'm summarizing and condensing and simplifying. Uh, he does elaborate far more on what this lawmaking process entails. But to make it simple, somebody or some group has to figure out what laws that they want to pass and regulations, uh, rules for people to abide by. So that's making laws, uh, enforcing or executing those laws. So putting them into practice, executing, and then enforcing them. Right, so make the laws, then you, uh, you actually implement them uh, by uh, uh, putting, those, putting those laws out, uh, putting in institutions that maintain those laws, and then of course enforcing them with some sort of law enforcement, whether it's police or military, whatever it might be. Uh, and then, uh, if you're trying to determine if people are guilty or if they're having some sort of dispute over a legal issue like property or, or whatever, you would interpret laws. So those are the three. And I, I should, probably should have listed them, but there's one, there's two, and here's three interpreting the laws. Uh, so that's kind of the three roles. And he argues that a lot of governments sort of have these all blended into one or two people or groups. Uh, and he thinks that this is a, a, uh, a recipe for disaster. I think he thinks there's three government forms, basically. There's uh, a, a free monarchy in that a king sort of rules over or a queen or whatever, uh, but the people are relatively free and, and he kind of sort of does his job, maybe like a benevolent dictator uh, or a benevolent monarch. Then there's like a democratic republic or republic basically, which is like a parliamentary government where you elect people to go and, and make the laws, etc. And then he off, act, argues there's like a despotic dictatorship where they're uh, just ruling through power and fear, uh, and that those pop up frequently in history, uh, as as you can see pretty easily, um, going across whether it's the you know the Khans of Mongolia uh, or many of uh, certain kings throughout uh, European history or emperors. Uh, or, or sultans uh, throughout the um, uh, uh, various imperial states uh, in history. There's lots of examples of people purely ruling for their own self-interest and using fear to enforce that, whether it's censorship or imprisonment or execution or a bunch of ridiculous codes and laws that have ridiculous punishments attached to them. Um, that's how they, <clears throat> they maintain power. So uh, his argument is that because these three are the fundamental elements of the law, and that it's easy for one person to sort of abuse these, that, in fact, you should uh, make sure, if you want a, a free society or, or one that's as free as it can be, uh, that has as much liberty as possible, you cannot put these three in the hands of one person or group. You have to evenly split these things up into at least uh, three different branches, ideally three different branches. And uh, this theory is referred to as the separation of powers, the concept. And that's his largest contribution by far um, to not only the Enlightenment, but to uh, all governments following the Enlightenment. Because this is going to be um, one of the fundamental codes or bases for, for governments um, following uh, in the West, at least, and increasingly uh, outside of the West, too. So separation of powers. The idea that you, uh, for, uh, to ensure liberty, liberty, you know, freedom, basically, a society where you're not being controlled against your will, um, it's actually bettering your life instead of making it worse. Uh, to ensure liberty, uh, a state or people must 
uh, split three administrative powers or roles, right, which is making laws, enforcing, executing them, and interpreting them uh, to three different branches. And uh, he's going to label those three branches and these functions. The making laws uh, is the uh, legislative branch. Oops, legislative branch. They're going to make laws. The ones who enforce them uh, are going to be the executive branch. Enforce and execute. Oops. And then uh, the ones that interpret laws are going to be the judicial branch. Those are the courts, essentially. And this one kind of confuses uh, most students. This is kind of just, uh, here's an example. Of course, if, a, if an officer arrests you of, of, of being convicted of a crime, whether somebody reported it or somebody saw something or the officer saw whatever, you're not guilty yet, and that's also part of the argument, by the way, is determining guilt and treatment of prisoners. But anyways, um, somebody has to decide if you did that or not. They're not just going to believe the official, whether it's a policeman or a government official or the, or the sovereign themselves. They're not just going to believe them because they said it. You have to have evidence. So they're going to have to prove that you did it. Uh, and the uh, court system is part of what does that, whether it's a judge or a jury. They look at the evidence and, and, and find out if, they, if it's beyond a reasonable doubt that you committed the crime. Then you get punished for it. But the judicial system also uh, uh, interprets how they should be punished. So like the severity of the punishment. Was it an intended uh, consequence or not? That'll, that'll affect you know, your prison sentence or your fine or whatever it might be. Uh, and they also will look into, uh, at least the United States, if this branch or that branch is doing something that violates um, your individual rights or a constitution. Um, that's known as... Um, uh, judicial review here in the United States, which we'll, we'll talk about, uh, at least in our government class. Um, but nonetheless, those are the three branches that he believes you should separate them into. Uh, and this is, a, this is a major, major, major um, step forward in, in making a more efficient uh, state system and governing uh, body. Uh, and this idea is going to be carried forward, of course, like we said, into uh, uh, many governments. The idea of, of separating powers into different groups is not new, uh, but the way he does it, the way he analyzes multiple states, uh, uh, characterizes their institutions, the roles of the government, and then of course suggests correctly uh, that um, if you put them all in one group or person's hand that they can too easily abuse them, uh, uh, and that it's better to ensure freedom. That to, uh, to ensure freedom, it's better to split these up rather than give them all to one person. Uh, and that's uh, of, of, of an, it's really hard to even explain how Im impactful these set of, this set of ideas was. In fact, I can actually give you some idea. Um, Montesquieu is actually the most uh, cited uh, Enlightenment thinker and author uh, in the Americas. So when, when the colonists were, were discussing and, and writing about uh, what should be done about England and how they're treat or how the British are treating them and how uh, they should uh, break free and start their own government. Nobody was cited more on, on, on what a government should look like and how it should be established than uh, Montesquieu's work here in the uh, Spirit of the Laws. So uh, he's the uh, most cited um, uh, human, no, not human, uh, Enlightenment uh, thinker in the U.S. and as well as uh, uh, the other future states of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I think they quoted the Bible more than him, but uh, as far as humans go on, secular humans at this time, nobody's quoted more than him, not Locke, not anybody else. Even though Locke is profoundly uh, influential in Voltaire and others, the amount of times they cited his ideas and used them, uh, Montesquieu was number one. Um, he's going to be the most influ influential, uh, uh, or the biggest influencer, not, a, not an Instagram influencer, I mean, I mean like somebody who ideologically influences them. Uh, most uh, impactful, most impact on James Madison. And if this is my government class, um, he's known as the father of the U.S. Constitution. And he influenced James Madison, James Madison in that he f showed Madison that to form a stable, good government, the foundation has to be rooted in, first of all, a constitution that specifically says what the government can do, but second of all, you've got to split these powers up uh, equally. In fact, they're going to add to that uh, system of checks and balances that make sure that these branches have some sort of power check on the other. So if one starts going off the rails, the other two can 
can stop it uh, or, or prevent it or, or reduce the severity uh, of the corruption or abuse um, as a result. So uh, that's going to be a major impact on James Madison. And if you're talking uh, AP Euro or other monarchs, he's going to influence many other people. Uh, he's also going to impact, for example, uh, Catherine the Great in Russia. Uh, she puts forward this, this uh, statement um, or set of instructions. What was it called? It was in Russian. It was like the Nakas or something like that, like N-A-K-A-S. I might have that wrong. It was in 1767. Uh, 1767. Um, set of instructions uh, to the... Uh, that basically put forward uh, a set of, of elaborations and, and information on... on the Russian legal codes and why they were legitimate and how they worked. Um, and of course, she's not going to, she's an absolutist monarch, so she doesn't take all these ideas, but she borrows the parts that help uh, enforce or consolidate her authority as far as an absolutist uh, monarch and, and the bureaucracy that the Russian czars uh, control. That's ultimately gonna really hinder their industrialization uh, later on. Uh, nonetheless, that is uh, sort of the role uh, and impact that uh, Montesquieu has as well as this. So whether it's uh, the Enlightenment as a whole and the ideas about how to, to, to find knowledge and assess the best way to go about things and protect individual rights and constitutions, etc. Uh, or it's Hobbes and Locke and their ideas on social contract theory or, or, or uh, Locke's idea on the blank slate and natural rights, Voltaire on religion or Locke on religion, uh, and then especially Montesquieu on the separation of powers. These are all going to be clearly visible in the startup uh, of the uh, of U.S. Constitution. And all these are going to impact profoundly the reason why the colonists uh, met together uh, and decided to uh, first try to make amends with the, the British Crown, but then, of course, declare their independence and then form a first confederacy, then a federation. Um, all of their decision making and their actions and the uh, ideas that they built the government with, both of them, uh, for, the, uh, for the United States is uh, firmly embedded in these beliefs. Um, so that's why we we take so much to talk about it. Whether in US history, AP US history, or American government, or whatever, um, this knowledge is critical uh, for you to know how this, these things progressed and, and why they exist the way they do. Uh, and that the rules and systems we have, well, certainly not perfect, there's a, there's a fair bit of rationale behind them. And if you look back historically, there's a lot of reasons why we have to have these things because um, some of those characteristics, while they're not, you know, they don't define us as humans, like our human nature, for example, uh, and our propensity to be selfish and, 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 and corrupt. Uh, it doesn't define us, but it's, it's, it's a feature that has to be uh, acknowledged. Uh, so we set up these systems that attempt to prevent that as much as possible. Uh, so not just arbitrary uh, and not anything else will work just as well. We know that we've tried a lot uh, and these are improvements and we should continue to try to improve it, but um, we don't wanna throw the baby out with the bathwater. We wanna make sure that we're not keeping things just for sake of tradition, that we're keeping things because if we get rid of them, we'll be worse off. So that's that helps, I guess, explain why our government works the way it does work. Uh, and then of course, as we go throughout the class and government anyway, that'll we'll, we'll look at a, a lot of the things that are wrong that we could certainly change and people have opinions about changing.